Hi, I'm Frank. Welcome to HB Insight Series, where we enter the minds of artists. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the HB Insight Series. Today, our guests are Ashley Olive Teague and Gwen Kingston. Welcome, ladies. And um, let's just start with, how are you? I'm having a, a terrible morning. Thank you for asking. Um, we just found out that the Supreme Court handed down a overturning Roe v. Wade, and I'm gutted. And as uh, uh, as this process we're a part of is all about creating affinity space with non-binary female identifying people. I'm just thinking like, how do we how do we hold space today? How do we walk into rehearsal and 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 and, and um, try to have a conversation about why anything matters right now? Yeah. <laughs> and and if art can be helpful in that, or if if not, if like if it needs something else, it needs a, a, a louder tool. Yeah, in the immediate aftermath of um, reading the news, I was selfishly feeling a little bit of gratitude that today we get to be in a room with um, a lot of women and non-binary folks and we get to hold that space together. Um, it's, a, it's a hard day for a lot of people. Yeah, and just the, the text messages and emails coming in already this morning from people who are trying to figure out what they need, I think. What is useful? Is it useful to be in a room together? Is it useful to try to think about something else? Is it useful to, you know, there's a protest today after after rehearsal that some people will go to. Is that what we need? Do we need to move, move slowly, you know, be together, be separate, be alone? Right, and letting the answer be different for different people. Yeah, and we probably need all of those things. I think it will, I think it will be, um, helpful to be together and with each other and there will be more than theater I think you're right I think theater will help and it does heal but you're right it's going to take more this is um, uh, news that's just it's hard to grapple with yeah yeah coming in here the first thing I said to you was like I don't know why we're I'm doing a podcast right now I don't know that I can do that I don't know I'm most, like what is this seems utterly absurd to me that we're doing a podcast right now yeah, but we are, but we are. I mean, we're in the moment, and we'll, you know, move forward the best we can. And um, so, let's talk about your. Let's talk about the group that you're working with, that you're in residency with, and what what your project is. It's called Dix, right? Yeah, it's called Dick. Yeah. Um, so this is a project that we uh, started collaborating on together years ago in a different time before there was a global p pandemic, and. Um, we had a residency uh, scheduled with HB Studios and it was postponed due to the pandemic and it's come back around. And what the, the project um, began as was an investigation into adapting uh, Herman Melville's Moby Dick, uh, which uh, primarily takes place on a whaling ship in the 1850s. And it's an all male space. There are really no non-male characters mm -hmm. whatsoever. And we were curious about what it would be like to uh, to take that space, that text, and populate it with everyone who's missing from that narrative, so women, non-binary folks, um, what it would be like to uh, commandeer that ship with an entirely different crew and play around in that space and honestly just see what that would do, see what we would discover um, by playing in that space. Yeah, and I would use an even stronger word than missing from the space, I would say excluded from, yeah. or something a little more actively. Um, yeah, I feel like Gwen mentioned like, oh, or people have said during rehearsal process, like, oh yeah, we had to read this in high school. And like, what does it mean when you tell a group of people, here, read this, or even like Shakespeare, right? Read this all white text, read this all male text. This is, this is what will teach us about culture. This is what will teach us about history. This is what will... Um, this is a great American classic, and then um, to look in it and say, "Huh, I'm not, I'm not there at all." Yeah, yeah. Or, no one in here looks like me. No one. Yeah. Yeah. I remember taking my nephew to see Frozen, and he was little. He was five, and afterwards he said, "Why didn't no one look like me?" And I, yeah, right. That 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 sort of sort of messaging happens so mm -hmm. early and is so deeply embedded that even during this process, it's hard to like uproot where those things are living in us. 
and like how long you have to be in a space that isn't mitigated by white supremacy culture or the patriarchy before you can like get it quiet enough to actually hear yourself think, you know? Yeah. And it still is, obviously. Today's the prime example of how we still are living in that world, but we have to just keep fighting back and going and going on and, and with the art and the creating and the speaking out. And um, so how are you finding the process as you've been rehearsing? How long have you been rehearsing? Uh, we started on Sunday and it's Thursday. Oh, just with HB, we've just been here this week, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we're doing a, a week long workshop. And um, I think that from the beginning of this workshop, we, we sort of decided for ourselves that this was going to be about process more than about product, that mm -hmm. what we were really interested in was being in a room with these, uh, with these this set of bodies and brains and collaborators and uh, seeing what would come of this experiment. And for me, there's been, uh, there's been a lot of joy in the room. It uh, has been a big part of my experience. Um, I've, I've felt a lot of joy being in that space with those people. Yeah, I had, I was saying to my partner the other day um, that there are like tears every day. It's like <laughs> when you when you work with preschoolers <laughs> or kindergartners and like, well, someone's gonna cry, that's just part of your day. And I said to him, if there had been even one man in that space, I can guarantee you that wouldn't be happening. We wouldn't feel like mm. we could do that. Yeah. But that we understand like, oh, this is a space where you can have that and it doesn't make people uncomfortable or like we don't feel like we need to take care of each other, that, that like that can live and yeah and, and inform the conversation another part of the experience that felt unique to me in that way was that um ashley's uh niece uh two-year-old niece was uh, with her for a time and so um this week and so her niece was in the room with us and it was such a, a joyful part of the process to have this little being running around and um interacting with everyone and being on stage and that 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 there was that this process could hold the space for that like no problem we were all so glad to have her there yeah and that i i knew you know oh i you know we were having child care issues and i knew you know what this isn't all female identifying non-binary space i i completely trust that these individuals will be excited to help us create a room where that's possible to have to have a child in it and like we'll be enthusiastic about like communally like taking care and that it enriches Jayliani. the process right it doesn't compromise the process it enriches the process and yeah and that like getting to you know so much of what we talk about is i think it, as our ideas are shaped around gender gender and sexuality is like our coming of age and you know reading these books or seeing these movies or and so to see a, a little girl who's two the two characters that she sort of takes on are Minnie mouse this super femi pink dress boat and superman She's Superman and she's Minnie Mouse. And like, I always wonder like, when is someone gonna say to her like, no, no, you can be Superwoman. When is that like gonna mm. be put on her in a way that she has to start to reevaluate what her options are? Yeah. I wow. remember as a kid uh, wanting to be president and, and it being made, made aware to me like, well, only men ha have been president in this country. That's only, and I yeah. thought, well, so I'll have to be a man. Geez, that's a bummer. No. <laughs> I'd hate to have to do that, but I want to be president, so I guess right. I'm going to have to do that. Because I'm just going to have to be a man. Yeah, we talked a lot about our experiences um, the other day within the group about when we learned sort of what it meant to be in a female body or to be in, I don't know, to be in our body. Um, and my experience was slightly different than Ashley's, which was like, I was, I grew up hearing a woman can absolutely be president, but you have to be a certain kind of woman, right? Yeah. Yes. And not Minnie Mouse. <laughs> Certainly not Minnie Mouse. No bows, yeah. no pink. Yeah. Well, what a memorable experience, I'm sure, for your daughter to be with all these wonderful artists for that day. Um, and so, and how did you put this group of artists together? Are these people you've worked with before? Yeah, there are a few different routes. Um, a couple of them are, so I have a theater company called Notch Theater Company, and we create um, community, responsive community engaged theater, storytelling, performance work to support grassroots uh, movements, social justice movements um, nationwide. And so um, a couple of the individuals are part of our artist advisory committee. Um, a couple of the individuals are just actors that have worked with Notch that I know um, are down for the justice movement, get mm -hmm. the mission. Um, and then we also held open auditions because always trying to like, you know, bring new folks into the conversation, expand yeah. the community. So we, we posted open auditions and um, one of the actors came to us uh, through that process as well. 
Yeah, new energy is always good. And how long has Notch been? When did you start Notch? 2017 is when I founded Notch. We met in grad school at uh, Brown University, and um, right after that, I, I I launched Notch. Wow. Well, and how's it going? How do you find it um, creating and running your own theater company? It must be so challenging. You know, how's what's really... Um, nice about it is that I don't have to wait for anyone's permission to make my art. Mm. You know, I do spend a lot of time applying for grants and residencies and um, that sort of thing, but also like pandemic happened. I had nine projects going because my work is really um, enmeshed in community um, and, in, in social work in a way, in arts activism. And so um, the need for the work was still there. And so the work continued to happen. And I, um, I can't imagine how hard it is if you're just a freelance artist and you have to, you know. Yeah. You have to sort of wait for that permission. Yeah. There's a lot of work that goes in behind. It's more than the art. It's like you have to do that whole side with the grants and all that stuff. That's a lot of uh, it's a lot of work. Um, but that's incredible. You're so driven. <laughs> so um, that's uh, awesome. And so you guys met in college in graduate school. In graduate school, yeah. And um, I, yeah. We, uh, Ashley was a director and I was an actor uh, in the program. And so we, that's when we began you know, collaborating on things. And, and after we graduated, um, it was very clear to me that I, I wanted to be a part of the work that Ashley was doing and that she continues to do. It's incredibly uh, powerful work that, um, that I, I just have huge admiration for. And so every opportunity that I've been given to collaborate on something with Ashley, I always, always want to play. And I think this yeah. is the fourth time that we've collaborated. Yeah through Notch, we've collaborated on other things right. separately. Um, and one of the projects was an adaptation of Anna Karenina that was also about um, the consequences of female revolution, let's say. That's a real simplification. And um, we had a residency at HV Studio. We got to do sort of the same thing we're doing, and it was really a big part of the development process. And we ended up, it ran for four weeks um, at the Flea Theater. And right before the pandemic in 2019. Yeah, it was our last, for me anyway, that was my last sort of theatrical experience before the pandemic hit and it had been so incredibly joyful and kind of um, uh, outrageous and fabulous. You know, that was my experience of it. And then and um, when everything shut, it was such a this sense of loss of like, oh, being in those rooms, being with those folks. I mean, for so many reasons, of course, um, to grieve, but that was, that was my experience of what was theatrically that, that loss of those spaces. Yeah, and then one thing that Gwen has been saying about, like, when we decided how do we want to do this week, do we want to, like, put a reading together and share it, or what would be, like, actually useful to our process? Um, and Gwen used this metaphor of, like, I wrote this thing two years ago. We did, like, an online, like, a Zoom thing around it, and we had, like, a little read. you know, we've done some little things, but, um, and she's sort of said, like, I just feel like the clay has gone cold on the... Whatever that is, um, whatever canvas, the thing spit, is, that the spinner, clay is on. Yeah, yeah. Whatever the clay is on, <laughs> yeah. and I need to, like, how do we get some like friction on it, some like motion, yeah, to mm -hmm. get it get it moving again. We were so glad for the opportunity to come back around to spend um, a week here at HB workshopping. Um, but yeah, my experience was the world has turned upside down a couple times since I first put these words down on the page, and they mean different things now. And um, and I'm a different person than I was when I wrote them. Um, yes. we all are. And so trying to find our way back into what were we after then? What are we after now? Are they mm -hmm. different things? Are they the same thing? Does this even make sense in this world that we now live in? And so that's been part of our journey this week. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. And I hope uh, so. And I hope a lot of those questions get answered. And so do you think will will it might continue after this week, this project? I think we'll my have a life. Um, I mean, who knows? You're, you always hope, right, that things um, have legs and continue to matter. Um, but my goal for this week was certainly to come out of it with... Uh, my hope was that the, the text itself would be fundamentally changed um, by this process, that by the end of the week I would come out with, you know, tons of notes for my next draft that mm -hmm. is, you know, that, that takes it uh, to a new place was my hope, that we don't um, simply execute what we had before but that we're... Genuine. We're getting in there and, and, and molding the clay, right? Getting it warm and malleable again. Yeah, so we didn't, we chose to not begin with like just reading the text that exists on first rehearsal. We started with a lot more like sort of um, story circle activities, if people are familiar with that, those kind of exercises and getting to know each other and getting to be in conversation and trying to build some trust so that we could 
-hmm. have the conversations necessary to um, uh, you know launch the ideas of the play. Um, and uh, a friend of mine who's also on the Artist Advisory Committee at Notch, Aluk Edwardson, who is Native Alaskan, came in and talked to us about whaling practices, which her community um, you know, has used since, since the beginning of time and, and still is a big part of the culture. And so getting just different perspectives and tools and resources and conversations cooking um, so that we weren't just feeling like we were in response to a text that already existed, but so that that text was also then just one piece of the development process around um, what, what, what we're trying to go after is not just an adaptation of Moby Dick, because, Lord, that's been done, and, and we don't <laughs> need another one of those, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, but to get after this idea of what is it to um, step inside a work that uh, has paid no attention to you and say, hey, listen to me, I got an idea, yeah. I have a thing to say about this. Hey, this thing you wrote all the way back then, now I have something to say about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so that's been very fruitful and a lot of really beautiful conversations and I think relationship building has come out of that. And we've done a lot of improvs around different sections of the, of the play and different ideas in the play um, and a lot of sort of character work and, and that sort of thing rather than just like sitting down and... Uh, yeah. Making reading a reading and, happen, yeah, it's and more discovering, doing. yeah, and discovering, you know, so many discoveries for me. But one of them is that um, that simply seeing these bodies in these roles feels inherently kind of transgressive and political, right? Before you even go in there and start changing the words, um, that there is something powerful, and as we are, you know, made even more aware of today, um, bodies of female identifying folks and bodies that have, you know, uteruses and vaginas are inherently political sites, right? We're mm -hmm. fighting, we're waging a battle about those bodies right now, continuing yes. to wage those battles. And so, um, yeah, just simply, <laughs> simply placing those bodies in those the roles visual, yeah. has a power that I continue to find kind of astonishing. Yeah, yeah. And, and doing the work that, um, female identifying individuals need to do around um, acknowledging sort of the barriers that stand between us and the ways that we've harmed each other and oppressed each other and have not like held held each other up and supported one another and um, how do we do better at that? How do we really see each other? How do we create movements that allow everyone to be fully human and all their, um, you know, different uh, intersectionalities? Um, and so, I th and I think that's a conversation that I'm really interested in creating space around having and figuring out how to mm -hmm. heal and repair and, and move forward. Yeah, and it's much needed right now. And it's, it's, things are changing, but it's such a slow, tiny pace. So I think the work that you guys are doing is going to and be really- And sometimes you go backwards. <laughs> and then we, there's days where we go backwards, exactly. So I think that work is going to be so impactful. And um, Gwen, what came first? Were you interested in acting or playwriting first? Or how did your, how did your journey begin as an artist? Do you remember where and when that happened? You know, they've, you they've always been intertwined for me. And I think that anyone- uh, well, let's say lots of folks who are interested in, in um, making performance when you're young, you know, you got to do everything, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you write, you direct, you act in your own, you know, your own yeah. things. Um, and, but I think that, so I was always interested in writing, but I think that uh, acting um, always felt very warm to me because I loved uh, community and collaboration. And that's sort of, uh, as an actor, you have so many more opportunities, I think, to be in rooms full of people and writing tends to be very solitary. So for a long time, I gravitated toward that. Um, and uh, I went to Brown as an actor, but um, one of the reasons that that program called to me was that they uh, allowed and even encouraged actors to take playwriting all three years. And so I knew that both of my identities would be welcome there. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the two things felt very um, related to me. And then, and then coming out, I had the great good fortune to uh, be able to work with Ashley as a playwright on a number of projects coming out. Um, so that sort of solidified for me that I would be doing both in the world um, after leaving graduate school. Yeah, I was thinking that while you were both talking about your rehearsal process this week, because I was thinking, oh, writers are usually sol solitary, but you're going to get all of this great um, inspiration for your piece because you have a week of doing with people. And like you said, instead of just sitting there reading and taking notes and someone going, oh, maybe this section, do, 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 it's like you're actually just 
exploring physically with your bodies. And yeah. yeah, she's on stage with the actors. Yeah. I'll be like, Gwen, will you play this role? <laughs> really great. But yeah, and, and our writers, of course, are um, are as diverse as any group of humans and need different things. I happen to be a very collaborative writer. I love other yeah. voice. I love um, other hands in my documents. Yeah, <laughs> I love other <laughs> other voices in my head. Um, yeah, yeah. Excellent. And then, and Ashley, when did you first realize you had the artistic? warrior in you do you remember you know I don't um, know you get asked that question a lot I should really have a go-to answer for it but <laughs> just like it's always been that way I was always always playing make-believe and always arts and crafts my kindergarten first grade birthday party was an arts and crafts birthday party it was like you know so I've always like that and I started acting when I was in second grade I was doing mm-hmm. plays um and then I guess I shifted to directing in undergrad a little bit Mm -hmm. started directing then and worked in tv and film for a while after that out in la and um so yeah so it's just always been very clearly a part of my identity in sixth grade we have like we had like superlatives i guess are they called Mm -hmm. it was like the teachers wrote these like cute like when we were graduating cute little like you know gwen kingston went on to write the next great american (laughs) novel and own whatever you know and they wrote this and mine was all about being an actor and doing my own stunts or something like that (laughs) um and so that's always been that's just always been and that's always been how other people knew me too so think of it as my church the theater yeah Yeah, and wh- where did you grow up? Did you grow up in New York? I grew up in Northern Virginia, outside Washington D.C. I was a go- I'm a government brat. I don't know if you do that in present <laughs> or past tense. Um, and then I did my undergrad in Boston, and then I lived in L.A. for eight years, and I worked in TV and film for a while, um, which is a totally different world, a completely different process, you know, completely different paycheck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, how did you decide? I had to move on. How, what did you find that you weren't getting in Los Angeles in that? Yeah, so my work? job was I did behind the scenes. So I would go on set and I'd have a camera guy and a sound guy. They're always guys, so they're guys. And um, they we'd film the filmmaking process. We'd interview all the actors and the um, the makers. Then we'd edit together. Like, remember when you got DVDs and there'd be special features or like yeah. HBO behind the scenes? Mm-hmm. And um, I was in a hotel in. I want to say Stamford, Connecticut, and I was writing a birthday card to my nephew, and I like was flipping through my book, and I realized, you know, my life at this point was like hotel, airport, set, airport, hotel, set, and I realized I'd missed all of my family's birthdays, and then I went and like tracked back, and I'd missed all my friends' birthdays that year too. I just had like this acute realization that that wasn't what I wanted out of life. Mm-hmm. That wasn't me. And around that time, I saw a play um, by Cornerstone Theater Company in Los Angeles, and they make community-engaged theater. It was by Julie Marie Myatt, and it was called Someday, and it was about um, reproductive rights. And it was just such a beautiful approach. It, like, featured this woman who had MS and was in a wheelchair um, and who wanted to have a baby and couldn't, and an interracial couple who couldn't have a baby and they were going to adopt and they're trying and woman trying in vitro and it wasn't just like the obvious like argument that people have around abortion yes it had real testimony from young women who had had abortions provided by Planned Parenthood but it was about like this is a really big conversation about reproductive health and there mm-hmm. are a lot of different um ways into it and uh and um, it was excellent. I couldn't tell who was community actor. It had community actors and professionals on stage, and I couldn't tell who was who because the stories were so real that even yeah. when it seemed like not good acting, you almost thought, man, that's a really exciting acting choice to yeah. just be that, yeah, yeah. like, um, mm. authentic, mm-hmm. right? And, uh, and so I was like, yep, quit my job. I took a 70% pay cut and started working for that theater company and, and learning their methodology and um, started a program there called Talk It Out where we... Um, use theater to um, bring awareness traveling in California talking about the school to prison pipeline crisis. At the time, LA schools were expending, uh, expelling and suspending more kids than they were graduating. Wow. And um, we, you know, had uh, the show happened at the state capitol where it directly affected policy. And so I thought, yeah, right, this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. And I went back to grad school to get my MFA so that I could. Um, uh, try to do it on my own, try to start my own company. Yeah. 
Wow. And so is Cornerstone still going? Cornerstone is. They've been around. They were founded by a man named Bill Roush out of Harvard in 84, I want to say. And um, they started out like a bunch of hippies in a van going all around. And then they landed in wow. L.A. And it's now the artistic director is Michael Garces. And, um, and yeah, they're still in L.A. And they're still doing the work. And uh, a lot of, you know... Um, what I use in my spaces are methodology that I learned uh, during my time at Cornerstone. Wow, that's uh, that's amazing. That's incredible that uh, you had such a wonderful learning ground. Yeah, and that it really just yeah. showed you where you need to focus. Yeah, the and, rest of your and life. putting you know, uh, a lot of like young artists will want to meet with me sometime. You know, I get a lot of outreach to Notch, and it's like. They want advice, and it's like, oh, man, I don't know. The only thing I know is, like, put yourself in proximity to the artists who are making the cool stuff you want to... Put yourself in proximity to the communities. Put yourself in proximity, like, you know, that's the... Yeah. Yeah. And I, so what, what other advice would you have to young artists or artists around the world, but each of you, if you could have a little love letter to people about being an artist, what would you say? My husband always says, if you could do anything else and be happy, you should, because it's brutal. Exactly <laughs> what I was brutal. thinking. It's like, it's really <laughs> hard. And the thing lot, yeah. that keeps you in it is each other. The artist community is just so beautiful. I don't mm -hmm. know if they have cattle calls anymore, but I remember an acting teacher telling me, he wins this cattle call, and he's coming from a second job, and he's exhausted, and he gets there, and he goes, oh, shoot, you're supposed to bring a red tie, and I don't have one. Some guy says, I have a red tie. When I come out, I'll give you one. And someone else says, yeah, you should really have dress <laughs> shoes, too. What size do you wear? Let me help you out. And when uh, I can't take a gig, the first people I recommend are the people in my... And sometimes it feels like we're in competition with each other, I'll, you know, but it's so far from the truth. Yeah. These are the people that when you have a cold stretch, right, when you're not getting work for a while, for a week, a year, two years, like, those are the people who are there for you, who get it. That's your community, and that's, that's, that's really the thing that keeps me in it. Yeah, one of my formative experiences around that choice to sort of keep pursuing it into your adult, into my adult life was an acting teacher I had who was very formative for me in high school. And I asked him, you know, how do you know if you're supposed to do this? And he said, oh, well, don't do it. And I was like, what? You know, I wanted, I wanted the pep talk. And he said, well, if you're going to do it, if you're, if you have to do it, then you will. And it doesn't matter what I say. So I think that's, mm. that's my advice is like, if, if you have that quiet voice within you that says there is no other way, then that's what you listen to. And if it's not there, then for goodness sake, go find something else that brings you joy. Yeah. yeah. And the socioeconomics of it are something we don't talk about a lot. We don't talk about a lot that a lot, uh, you know, that a lot of the people who are making it are people who had to trust enough money some sort of financial safety net that they could flow until they got there. Yes. Um, and yeah. I wish that our community did talk more about that because, you know, it's sort of the silent thing that we can all look around and see. Like, oh, wow, how did that, how's that 30-year-old guy directing in that theater already? Like, well, who's his, yeah. who's his dad? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and so, and you mentioned Bill Roush, so who, who were your other mentors, Ashley? You know, mm -hmm. a, the people who are, I didn't actually ever work with Bill Roush. He was there before my time. Um, he then ran OSF, and now he's somewhere I don't in, in New York. Um, but my mentors are really a woman named Lori Woolery, uh, a man named mm -hmm. Peter Howard. Uh, Kimberly Senior is a director that um, I, I texted this morning when all this was happening. Is like a support system director, and you know, d advice. There's a, a group of four female directors, and we're on this text chain together, and. You know, when we have questions about, hey, I think they're kind of trying to screw me on this contract. What should I do? Or, mm -hmm. hey, here are my choices. What should I, you know, oh, God, I had this terrible preview last night. Um, uh, and so she's sort of the, the helm of that group. Mm -hmm. um, who else? Who else? Who else? Um, you know, Junebug uh, Productions, they used to be the Free uh, Southern Theater. Uh, John O'Neill ran them. The story circle methodology I use is from them and a training I did with them. Art equity, that I do a lot of trainings with them and their practice is really embedded in my methodology as well. Um, so those are some of the, the sort of methodologies. There's a group called Alternate Roots on Atlanta that I've done some training with. And so those are the, the, the sort, some of the building blocks and the threads that are in my, mm -hmm. my methodology. Wow, and Gwen, how about for you? Who are you, more of your mentors? Um, as an actor, uh, Laura Dolis, who, uh, who taught acting at UC Berkeley for a long time, was a hugely formative um, 
influence for me as an actor and then um, certainly all of the faculty and the Brown Trinity acting program where I went for graduate school. As a playwright, uh, Philip Gon Gatanda, who was at Berkeley when I was there, um, and I believe is still there, and we had the extraordinary privilege of studying with him uh, and also collaborating with him um, uh, as an actor on some of his plays while, while he was there as a playwright in residence, which was a glorious experience. And then at Brown, Deb Salem Smith, who teaches playwriting there, and is an extraordinary teacher. Uh, so those were some of my main influences. And then, honestly, Ashley, <laughs> Ashley Olivia Teague over here, um, <laughs> who has been uh, an enormous support to me as a writer ever since leaving Brown and was someone who um, really taught me and encouraged me to, to take my writing seriously and has been um, a huge mentor to me in that way. I look forward to seeing that in, in the introduction to your book, yeah. mm -hmm. your forthcoming book. Gwen, <laughs> Gwen has a book that she's working on a, a memoir that was, I guess it doesn't, commissioned isn't the way it works in that industry. You can fix, but by Schuster, is that who, who's publishing it? Um, uh, Simon and Schuster, yeah. Simon and Schuster, and that probably will come out next year sometime. 2024. Knock on, knock on wood, knock on wood. Wow, congratulations. That is excellent. How did that get started? Do, um... You, uh, briefly, I, I wrote a, a, an essay um, in the New York Times Modern Love column, um, and I, I'd been working on the book before that, but I sort of distilled it into an essay-length piece that ran um, a year ago, May, and um, and my my book is on the same subject matter, and so that uh, sort of drew interest and um, and uh, culminated in a book contract, which I'm currently fulfilling. The manuscript is due in December. Have wow. Wish me luck. <laughs> Currently, day by day, word by word. Word by word. Sentence I live with a metronome ticking in the back of my brain. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very that much. It's excellent. Great. And so, so what are, if you, what are some other struggles that you've had along the way, each of you, and how do you overcome? I mean, we talked about the community and your mentors, and you have your text change of the people that you keep really close. Um, but how do you? When you're struggling, how do you find the strength within to keep going on this path? Mm. The word strength I do is not one I resonate with in general, <laughs> but probably certainly in this moment. You're finding me on a really particularly strange uh, version of myself. All my <laughs> versions are strange, but this is a weird one you got today. And um, and really, I, the only like answer I have is community and other people. Yeah, like that's what holds me up. The, the, I'm a very uh, I don't know if it's social, but like I, I'm a very collaborative person. Mm -hmm. I remember my teachers in grad school telling me I was too collaborative, and I thought that's just how I. But that's how I do it. Like you, they were like, you can be more directory, you can be more authoritative, and I was like, oh no, I don't think so. I'd rather <laughs> yeah. not. I'd rather not do that. Do it that way. Um, so people, my family, you know. Yeah. And uh, and being being there for for them too, right? That AA thing of being of service. Yeah, and you have one daughter. It's my niece, actually, who was with me. Oh, your niece. My niece. Yeah, and what are your what are your hopes for her? Mm, that's a complicated question. She lives in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, which is the setting of Sweat, and in like the opening, it says set, set in Reading, Pennsylvania, saying like the poorest city in America, mm. which I really wish that was footnoted because that feels possibly inaccurate. But um, so she has she has a lot of things obstacles. Mm. Coming up, she's raised by a single mom who uh, works with adults with developmental disability, you know, for like 12 bucks an hour or something like that and works her butt off and is an amazing, amazing mom raising two kids. And uh, and that that's hard. I mean, I feel really lucky that I get to spend time with her and bring mm -hmm. her a rehearsal and say like, hey, here's a here's an option in the world. This is a this is a thing you could do one day with your life if that's if that's something you want to pursue. Um, and so I guess, like, that's not a good answer to your question, but I guess the short answer is, like, my hope for her is that she has options. Yeah. Just just so, more than one. Yeah. <laughs> that she gets to make a choice. Mm -hmm. She's so fortunate to have you in her life and, and her wonderful mom and that she got to experience the rehearsal process. I'm sure it blew her away, for sure. Yeah, she's very little, but she had a good time. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, anything? Gwen didn't answer. How do you oh. overcome obstacle in your life? Mm. <laughs> well, I think that sort of baked into the job description of being an artist is that there are going to be some dry stretches, right? There are going to be some stretches that feel um, either unproductive or or where you feel lost or where you know the next opportunity hasn't materialized. And I think that for me, 
For a long time in my life as an artist, the thing that if you'd asked me what I was after, what I was interested in, quite honestly, would have to do with sort of recognition and conventional markers of success, right? You're looking to land the job, not only because you need the job, but because you want to feel that you are good at what you have set out to do and, and that you have been recognized for that. And I've realized that that is really not a very sustaining motivator. Mm -hmm. um, and that when the dry spells come along, the only thing that pulls me to continue to make work in the face of that is to, to get to listen really deeply to what I'm interested in as an artist, right? Like what makes me curious and excited and makes me feel alive. It's really hard as an actor because so much of your process is contingent upon, it feels, being given as, uh, being given opportunities in which, in context in which to do your work. So it's yeah. a particular struggle for an actor to figure out what work interests me, how do I keep my artistry alive when the jobs are not there. Um, as a writer, we have a little bit of a cheat code on that, right? We can, <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we can generate yeah. um, our own work. So th those have been, and, and probably those, those when I've done sort of some of my most fruitful writing has been in a time when, you know, I have, I have no one telling me what to write. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and no deadline to work toward. And so I have to listen very deeply to what, what is the thing that I must, that I must uh, investigate. Um, I think, and it's, it's a much more sustaining motivator than looking for a gold star or a pat on the head. Yeah, it's sustaining, but that is hard to really look inside yourself. I think for any artist and say, what do I want to say right now? What do I want to talk about? And, and a lot of us don't know until we have to, I think is the thing. Like yeah. the, if you go along kind of getting the work, getting the job, then mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have to investigate that until the dry patches come along. Um, and, and we need work, right? We need to do the work that we are given because we need to, uh, we need to make a paycheck and we want to, you know, I think many of us feel that, you know, to make a living at our art would be sort of feels, um, uh, I think it's what a lot of us uh, dream of, right? To be able to do that and only that. Um, so the work itself is important, of course, but the artistry piece of it, um, yeah, what, what must I say? What must I do? Definitely. Yeah, you're right. It's while we're getting the work, we don't have to think about that that much. And then it's in that dry spell. Exactly. Yeah, and it's, it's hard. It's, it's so hard to be that, to be an actor and be dependent on the rest of the world and the process. And it's, I'm sure, so hard. You, Ashley, you saw it when you l were working in Los Angeles. It's like, the, the you know, the thought is always like, what what do they want me to be? <laughs> when going into an audition, it's like, I'm sure, you know, you're on the other side of that. Like, And you never know what they want. You just have to be yourself. And if it fits, it fits. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit, right? And you move on to the next thing. But. And also acknowledging the incredible privilege of being able to continue to work on your art and, you know, when when you're not getting paid to do it, right? That is a privileged mm -hmm. position to be in, to be able to figure that out, um, to be able to keep putting time into that that's not compensated time, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, and the, and the what do they want me to be, like, extends into the audience, right? We, we only exist in relationship to an audience. You can go make your art in your basement, and that's beautiful. But that's not actually the. That's not actually. It doesn't actually exist until there's an audience there, right? That's the final piece of it to right. be in conversation with that piece, and so it means like, you know, like um, we're dependent on that piece to for the survival of our industry, right? That there is that relationship there. I took this entrepreneurial artist course a long time ago, and I remember. The learning an example they gave is like you love to make green pots but the people like to buy the brown pots so you have to find the venn diagram where you like create enough of the brown pots to sell so you can make the green pots mm. and part of the like whoa the give and give and take of what we do <laughs> yeah right that's simple that's a simple way to get it yeah or and you like, hear that all the time like so and so made this movie for whatever amount right. of money so that they could make this movie right yeah, my yeah. partner does a lot of commercials because they pay so that he can do the theater that doesn't pay that well mm -hmm. uh yeah yeah or it can or it can be your hobby or you have a day job which a lot of actors do they have a day job that pays the bills and then this other thing um is something they love that they do you know second when they can yeah yeah, but you're right. It's 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 changes the piece completely when you have the witness, like the audience is the witness, and you always need that energy 
yeah. coming back to you because that is what it makes it. We're making it for someone. It's the meant to be shared, right? Art is meant to be shared. Yeah, yeah, like you said, you have something to say, and I would argue that some people probably don't actually have anything to say. I kind of <laughs> want to think about that more, but if you're saying it to someone, I have something to say to someone. Mm-hmm. And so, and you know, last yesterday we were talking about the end of the play, and I said, you know, I have a couple of beliefs about the end of the play, but the main one is that it doesn't end on stage. That like, ah, oh, it's not a very good play if it ends on stage. And we clap, and then we turn to each other, and we're like, you want to go get pizza? <laughs> it needs to end in the audience. And he mm. said the last moment of the play wants to end in the audience, and ideally it uplifts a question or a conversation that then we take, like, well, we have to go get pizza because we have to have this conversation now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, w- I, I love uh, performances, uh, theater and film, where... I'm speechless after. <laughs> and I really have to sort of, it's still resonating. processing yeah, and resonating processing. for, you know, and, and there's powerful pieces that can, well, they can haunt you forever, but but really haunt you for days and still processing and, and thinking about it and answering questions in your own head. Or so, so, yeah, I agree with you. That's a great way to put it, that it doesn't. Yeah. And with the end, it like ends on the you, audience. You know who I learned this from? And I should have slayed, slayed it or referenced them when I talked about my mentors, but Eric N., who is a playwright, and who I went to with Rwanda to. I did a genocide studies program in Rwanda where we met artists and learned about the history of the genocide. And, um, and I've since gone back and made work there um, with a group called Masharika. And a lot of sort of my theories on theater come from, come from his teachings. Wow. I think my, you know, I say, you hear me say all the time that people say that theater is about drama, but I think it's about change. That people say it's about conflict, but I think it's about change. Change in the status quo or in a character or in the world of the play or ideally if we do it well in the hearts and minds of the audience. That's, that's an Eric N. Mm. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so it's about the... I see what you're saying, the character's changing, but then the... the it's about, yeah, that sometimes when we look at a play and we critique it or we try to understand it, we look at what the conflict is, what's the drama. Yeah, you we're, always hear that. Oh, well, let's do this scene, like, where was the conflict? Where are we... And I'm interested more in, like, how is it changing? How is... how what In documenting the change, how does the protagonist change? How does the antagonist prevent the change? How does the world change? How do, How's the audience ideally changing in response to the ideas and feelings... Yeah. On stage. Yeah. Oof, that feels like a big job today. Mm. It is. Uh, is there anything you guys want to uh, touch on before we end or promote? Or um, obviously, Notch Theater is going Notch strong. Notch Theater, Gwen's book. And Notch Theater has a lot of um, programs operating simultaneously, not to put you in the hot seat to enumerate all of them, but um, you, have a lot, you have a lot going on um, over Notch, a lot of simultaneous projects. Yeah, we have about five or six, seven, eight, maybe, in development. A bunch in development right now to do, should I talk about them or I, they can say that and you could visit our website maybe. Yeah, what's your, <laughs> what is your <laughs> website? Um, NotchTheater.org. Yes, it's the website. And so your programs and projects are all most of them are there. Yeah, we have three yeah. new ones. Um, this playwright James McManus. Uh, during the pandemic, there wasn't a big need for playwrights. Shockingly. Mm. I think when the, Some Armaged- of us started writing when the Armageddon comes, they're going to say, yeah, playwrights, go over there and write a play for us. And then they'll turn to each other and say, let's eat them first. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he worked at an Amazon factory. And so he's interested in writing a piece based on those experiences. And we're going to wow. ideally do interviews in Bessemer where there was yeah. attempts to unionize and in uh, Staten Island where they did decide to unionize, see how that moves. And in Buffalo, there is a Starbucks that is having conversation about unionize. So talking about how this moment of unionizing right is repeated from history but also um is very defining for a certain social class and generation yeah so so that's one of the new projects that that isn't quite up there yet we have a project around recovery addiction and eating disorder and trauma grief and um a project around gratitude so our projects all start from a com- uh, someone expressing an interest in the community they they live in and saying, hey, I think I need to talk about this in some ways. This is something that um, theater could, could support or amplify. Yeah, covering a lot of bases and that they're all much needed. Yeah, next month we'll be in Arkansas um, on a project called Remember 2019 that's been going on since 2017 that creates community or 
um, brings community of artists together in the black community in the Arkansas Delta around um, memory and healing. And uh, and so that, that project has been going on for a long time. It's taken many different forms. There's a touring blues uh, concert piece. There's a community mural. There's a book. Uh, so... So that we'll be doing next. And then we have a piece about climate change that Gwen has written for before, actually. Yeah, a project called Wild Home um, that uh, has had... So how many iterations now? How many communities? Uh, we're working with Native Alaskans in Alaska, Colorado, and Appalachia, and then it's going to travel to D.C. next year. And I got to collaborate on the um, the piece that is uh, pulled from, from stories from Appalachia. And these are communities affected by... Um, by fracking and by extraction industries in general that have a history of extraction yeah. usually in the area and continue to be affected by um, extraction of natural gas, of oil. Um, and uh, for me, as the playwright on that project, it was an um, extraordinary experience of like deep listening, of just sort of going in and hearing like what is the lived experience of the folks who live in this place. They may not all agree with one another, right? People have very different experiences of these things. Yeah. Um, and then how do, cre how do we create... Um, a theatrical event that speaks to those experiences, and one of th and and the privilege of being invited into someone's home, <laughs> into someone's story, into someone's experience, and as a playwright, the question of like, how do I tell the story? How do I make someone feel seen? And how do I not do further harm in a community that has gone through <laughs> a lot, right? Um, so that was for me um, an extraordinary experience of being invited, invited into. Um, someone else's space to make work that you know you hope you hope matters you hope makes a difference um, yeah that's a, it's a huge responsibility and I could see that you wanting to do it justice and not um, like you said do any harm but make them yeah. something one, that they're proud of one of the thing that, that Ashley that Notch is amazing at is going to community and just asking what do you need right like what mm. what would be what how could this experience be something that is positive that fills a need that's in the community instead of coming in saying hey we know what you need mm -hmm. which I think is important yeah just saying would it be useful like here's the thing that we're really good at doing we see the work that you're already doing would this be helpful to that work would this be a support rather than this other thing that's supposed to take time away from your life but yeah would telling this story be useful to you yeah and Gwen, is your is will the book be titled Modern Love? Same title? No, no, no. So Modern Love is a column in the New York Times. Okay. Um, and so the the essay ran as part of that column. Um, the book still has a working title, so I won't share it in case it changes. Okay. Um, so, but uh, yeah. Hey, have us back to HB Studios in, yeah. uh, in, in a little bit, and I'll be <laughs> yeah. able to talk more about it. <laughs> we will be on the lookout for it. And um, thank you so much for uh, talking with us on this uh, incredibly trying and sad day. And um, do you have any final, anything you want to share with um, the world or the artists? Or I want to say thank you to HB for uh, giving us the space for this week. Um, it's been, um, it's, it's meant a lot to me this week. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, ladies. And continue um, creating and sharing because... We're all here to witness your your wonderful work, and it's uh, I'm, I'll be there tomorrow night, and I'm sure it's going to be overwhelmingly moving. So I'm excited. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's an episode of our HB Insight series. Thank you for listening. Please like and follow us on social media at HB Studio NYC. Subscribe to us on your podcast provider for future episodes. And visit our website at www.hpstudio.org for classes and more information. Till next time.